So you were talking to Stephen about another project last July. And yeah. uh, so I'm curious, what was that other project that you were talking about be right before you transitioned into, let's make a movie about it during the pandemic? Um, it's a, I have an idea for a spy franchise. Yeah, my first time venturing back into that world since Born Identity. And uh, so I was talking to Steve about that. And then, uh, and on that call, uh, PJ Sandwich was on the call. Um, and at the end of the call, PJ was like, well, why don't we talk about, what about writing something right now to shoot this September? Because the spy thing was like for the future. Sure. Post pandemic. And, uh, and possibly for me after I go to space. I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was for the future. And PJ's like, what about something we do right now? Um, so that's, you know, it was, uh, I'm actually working with a, with an actor on the, uh, on the spy thing. And uh, he, the funny thing is like, in, in October, he was like, you know, have you found a writer yet? And I was like, well, a funny thing happened. <laughs> My first conversation with a writer about our spy idea, we ended up deciding to write a different movie and I've now gone and shot it. He was like, what? I was like, we, we just, we came up with an idea for a different movie and we've and, and he's like, what do you mean you shot? I said, we, he was like, that was just like yesterday. I was like, I know, we, we, we came up with an idea for a movie and we wrote it and we've now shot it, I'm done. So now I can focus back on our spy idea. And he was like, was that gonna happen to the next writer you talked to? Like, I was like, no, no, that was like, that's like a one-off situation. That's never happened before. How, how easy was it for you? Talk a little bit about, you know, sometimes getting financing for something can be tricky. And so you guys come up with the idea talk a little bit about was it one of these things where you got the financing super fast like it was one of these things you how did that come together yeah because you know so I, I was talking about the insurance of it all like I was you know the idea was we were going to try to shoot a movie going go go to really into uncharted waters uh, there were no independent films going into production in England you know there was there's no way to get insurance it's like it there's no way to guarantee you can finish the movie, which is the biggest risk somebody makes when they finance a movie is, it's not, what if the movie's not good? The biggest risk is what if the movie isn't completed? And you normally get things called completion bonds. You know, none of that was gonna be possible. So when we were, I said, when we approach a financier, we're gonna have to make this attractive enough to them that they're willing to take a chance that that the gamble's worth it which means shooting it at a low enough budget that if the film is not able to be completed it was worth the risk because on the flip side if we do complete it the reward would be enough so that that was from my my conception from the beginning was that we needed to do this um really uh um, we need to keep the budget down because of the pandemic. I said, we need to shoot this quickly because every week that we're shooting runs the risk of, of somebody getting sick and, and the production being shut down. Uh, and so it, which luckily shooting quickly also brings the budget down. So at least everything was sort of pointing in one direction, which is, the, the only shot we had to get locked down financed and, and the best shot we had to be able to finish shooting the movie, complete it, would be to shoot it very quickly. And I really was interested in, you know, I, I, my films reflect the environments in which they were shot. There's other filmmakers who just totally control the environment. It doesn't matter what's happening in the world. I, 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 I allow the real world to seep into my movies. So the shaky camera work of Born Identity 
was not a creative choice. That that really happened because Matt and I were sneaking into the Garda, Garda Nord to shoot something without a permit, and which I had been doing on my independent films prior to that. But the problem is Matt Damon was recognizable. So it was hard to sneak around the Garda Nord with Matt Damon. And so we kept having to move quickly before people recognized him. And that's why all that shaky camera work is because there was just no time to, to set up a shot. And it became part of the style, not only of the movie, but of, of, of the whole franchise. Um, so I, you know, experiences like that, you know, have, of allowing, you know, what's happening on the set to sort of infuse the actual footage, infuse into the footage, you know, has become, you know, part of my style of filmmaking. I said, you know, lockdown should be no different. It's, we're shooting this movie during a pandemic. Whatever that does to the production, I'm gonna let that appear on screen too. It will affect it. So in this case to, uh, because of uh, because of the budget requirements, because London was going to be shutting down around us while we we're shooting, said so we have to shoot this as quickly as possible. And I thought that's going to add an interesting tone and flavor to a movie that, for most of it, is Chiwetel and, and Annie at home, locked down. You know that could. I have a short attention span that could get pretty boring pretty quickly, but not going to get boring if, if it's, if it's filmed with the urgency of uh, we got to get, we got to get through this before we get shut down. That's going to end up on screen, which it does. There's a, there's an urgency and an energy to lockdown that makes it, you know, more fun and more fun with people with short attention spans. Um, and that, you, you know, if this same script filmed a year from now would shoot, you know, we shot in 18 days. If you shot this same script a year from now, ho hoping the pandemic's over, it would be like a 45 day shoot. And the film would look different. The performances would be different. 100%. You mentioned, obviously because of the pandemic, uh, the more people that are around, the more of a risk that COVID can seep into the production. So when you're shooting this uh, and with the 18 day schedule, are you purposely sort of pulling back as many people in terms of the behind the scenes? Like how did it affect the crew and the behind the scenes of what is right behind the camera? Are there just, you know, how, with the departments like, you know, a, a fraction of what they normally are? Yeah, it was, uh, luckily everything sort of lined up in the same direction, um, as I said, like, you know, keeping the budget number down and getting in and out before there's an outbreak both worked in the same direction because it meant shooting fewer days of shooting cost less money than more days of shooting. Um, similarly, um, I wanted the crew to be smaller because the more people working, the more chance there could be an outbreak. Every single person is, 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 is a risk factor. Um, and in particular on, on lockdown, and I'd probably not gonna make me look so good, but I, I, I used to work as a PA and I said, you know, the PAs are gonna be our highest risk on this movie. Cause you know, a, a, a 24 year old PA at the end of a long shoot day might still go out with their friends. There's no way that I or the DP or the cast are doing anything other than going to sleep or getting ready for the next day at the end of a shoot day because we're older. Um, and so I, I decided that we really had to limit the sort of entry level jobs on the production. And so, you know, each department had to, each department sort of had fewer sort of of the entry level production assistant people than they might normally have. And maybe it was unfair of me, but I just said like, you know, you're gonna, you're, people are not gonna have assistance on this movie. You know, like on my second day when I was like starving to death, cause I was like, why has nobody brought me any food? And they're like, Doug, it's because you said you didn't want any assistance on set. So like, if you want food, you're gonna have to go get something yourself. Like there's no, there are no assistance. Right. 
I actually think that probably uh, I get what you're saying because you're probably right. You know, when you're you, you I anyway, I, I could open that door. But um, you were doing one of the things that I think is fascinating that people might not realize is you set out you started with a hundred and eighty page script. Yeah. I guess that, which is just, you know, you th that's just a lot, you know. Yeah. Uh, so talk a little bit about for people that don't realize a hundred and eighty page script sometimes can mean a three hour movie. It always means a three hour movie. I mean, that's, you know, it's a page, you know, a minute, a page. And, you know, because Steve was writing the script up until basically we started shooting. Um, and so we didn't know, you know, Chiwetel, if you talk to him, you know, when I cast him, I gave him 90 pages of the script. That's all we had. And he said to me, you know, how, how is Steve Knight going to wrap this up in 20 pages? I'm really curious to see how he pulls that off. Uh, and then obviously the joke was he, it took 90 pages. Even then, I mean, Steve became like one of these, you know, people you, because you, then you know, he was giving us the pages in chunks. So the next chunk of pages took us to like page 140 and Steve swore there'd only be five more pages. And then the script ended up being about 180 pages. Um, and I didn't change the, the schedule, right? Because the same concerns I told you about, about COVID, about the budget, meant that I wanted to shoot the movie in 18 days. I really was thinking, you know, I shot Swingers in 18 days, but the Swinger script was 100 pages. Uh, and I was like, okay, we're just going to have to shoot twice as fast as we thought we were going to have to shoot. And that will be part of the style of the movie. And then, but I didn't want to make a three hour movie. And I didn't want to have to make choices in editing to throw things away that I liked because the movie was running too long. So my first step was to sort of read the script out loud to myself a little bit more quickly and time myself. And I sort of got to this place where I thought like a 40 seconds per page pace would make, wouldn't result in a two hour movie. And that ended up being, you know, my, the main instruction I gave, you know, you know, it would be the main instruction I gave as, as, as a director on the set of this movie was, can you just say that more quickly? Sometimes followed by, uh, I don't need you to act as much as you're acting. Just say the words, like the words will do the job for you. Like, Forget, forget about the dramatic pauses and, and like, we just, you know, you don't, we don't, because actors are used to putting dramatic pauses into scenes. And I was like, we just, we don't have time for that. We can, we can pick our moments where we're going to put the dramatic pause and, and it, and ultimately it makes lockdown more fun to watch because it's just, it's just moving along at such a breezy pace. But, you know, it was, it was, nothing Annie or Chuatel had ever confronted before. And to be honest, nothing I'd ever done before. I was like, but I, I said, this is, I, we have no choice because I don't want this movie to be three hours and I think it'll be really fun. Um, and they trusted me. I mean, this might be the fastest turnaround I've ever seen in terms of filming a movie, having it premiere. You know, this is pretty incredible. So uh, how did you- Giving a movie to- if you throw conceiving in, it's, it's for sure the fastest. Exactly. So my, my question is, was there any thought about, um, about where, where and when you wanted this thing to premiere? Um, we knew we wanted to finish it by the end of the year. Like, that was our plan. That was how we budgeted. I said, like, this is that everything was, everything was geared around being done by the end of the year. Um, we didn't know what the world would look like at the end of the year. We didn't know if, if the virus would be better, or worse, but we said like, we wanted, you know, this film is so definitively a 2020 story. We wanted to, sh to shoot it in 2020 and, and be done at the end of 2020, which we did. Um, and then while we were editing, suddenly the conversation turned to, okay, well, it's uh, how do we release this? You know, and we started having conversations with people who could distribute movies and, and, um, you know, because we really did want to get it out right away. And most of the buyers were like, well, you know, it's, we're big corporations and 
we we would take you know four to six months to come up with a plan for putting it out. And Warner Brothers saw it and said, we want it immediately. Like, how can you sh finish it any faster than you're currently planning on finishing it? Which was already a crazy schedule. Like to finish shooting at the end of October and be done at Christmas, which was our plan. Our last day of post was gonna be December 23rd. And they're like, can you make it December 18th? So we can put it on the air um, in, in January. And I, of course, said yes. And, you know, my producers were like, what? Are you crazy? But I was like, everything else we've done is crazy. Like, and I just love the spirit that we found a distributor that's as insane as we are. That's willing to sort of ask for the impossible. And we did. We delivered it. When you're shooting the movie, it's an 18-day shoot. When you're starting to get to like day 15, day 16, how behind are you in the schedule? Were those last few days like, oh my God, we have so much to do? We were never behind. Not one day. Or the feeling that I got towards the end was, because I was a little cavalier. If you'd heard me in conversations in August, you know, when I was raising the money for the film, I was a little cavalier. I was like, look, we're going we're gonna to set out to go make this movie and we're all taking a chance on it that it actually could be completed. And I, I would have been fairly cavalier. I'm like, I, I don't know if I can finish this movie. Like nobody can tell you it's finishable because we just don't, no one's ever attempted to make it, a, an independent film under these conditions ever. And it's, I'm gonna try, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put all of my, you know, brain power into rolling with the punches, whatever, whatever happens to the world. I'm gonna, but I don't know if I can finish it. I was really blunt about that. I don't know, I don't, I don't know if anybody, I don't know if it's possible to make a movie under these conditions, but we're gonna try. The thing is with each day of shooting, I was so in love with what I was getting you know, Annie and Chiwetel were just so amazing on screen. And, and Steve Knight's script was just, they were just bringing it to life way beyond my wildest dream of, of, of how, how, how good this movie could be. And so with each day, it became something that I was more protective of. So the cavalier attitude in August, by the time you asked me like what it would be like, you know, on day 15, on day 15, I was like trying to protect the 14 days that had preceded it. And it was like, we need to, we got, we just have four more days to get through. You know, it was like, please, like, you know, cause London was shutting down around us. That the opening shot of the movie was, you know, I shot, you know, on the two or three weeks into the production, I took a camera home and I was like, I'm just gonna film the intersection in front of my house cause London's now empty. You know, this, everything was shutting down, restaurants, everything. Uh, and um, so I suddenly was getting, you know, just, I had something to protect. So I was just, uh, that, that was what the emotion, but there was, we were not behind schedule. It's so interesting because I, I think about the shots that you got like that. And if this had been filmed God willing, the pandemic ends. And if, and if something was trying to recreate this, the cost of trying to get some of those shots would be so much more difficult. Yeah, you would end up with one or the other. You'd end up with sort of a big budget movie or, or you could end up with something that's quirky and small, but we were able to sort of do both because we were, we're a small character driven movie, but you know, we did have the scale of a, of a deserted London. Completely. Uh, let me ask you, uh, what, what, which cameras did you end up using and why? Um, we use the RE large format and uh, it was my DP's choice. Uh, Remy, uh, um, whose last name I still can't pronounce. I, I end up coming, you know, a lot of these DPs have, you know, my DP on, on, the wall, I can never say, I end up calling Roman the Russian, Remy Alden Fasarian, but it, it's, uh, um, you know, uh, it was Remy's choice and, and, you know, Remy was, was 
was a real hero of the production because, you know, to shoot this kind of page count and, and pull it off. I mean, he really, and, and, and do it so artfully. Uh, he was the perfect DP and, and, you know, it was like, I think it'd been a while since he'd done a film like this that was so, you know, so outrageous. I mean, this eight hundred and eighty page script in 18 days is the kind of movie that you sort of imagine, you know, a couple of kids go and make. Completely. Um, in fact, at some point on the, the shoot, you know, one of the grueling days, you know, Remy turned to me and he goes, do you have any idea how old I am? <laughs> And I said, actually, no. And then that was the end of it. We just kept going. Well, I, I want to, one of the things is you used to be a, a director of photography. You shot your early movies. How, when you're shooting something like Lockdown, where you have to do 14, 15 scenes a day sometimes, talk a little bit about how you pick camera placement for these scenes when you are just rushing through everything. How much debate is there we're going to put the camera here or we, this is the better shot. Um, yeah, you, you, you rehearse the scene. I mean, it wasn't, it was no different than other movies other than you, uh, you got to really think quick on your feet. And I was like, again, I was like, let's embrace that. We're going to go with our gut instinct. We would do one blocking of the scene and, and, um, I would, I, I or Remy would be like, I think we should, I think our, our hero angle should be here. And we just went with it. Like it was, you know, that when I work with Tom Cruise, you know, there's, there's more, we, we have more money and more time. And so in that kind of environment, Tom and I like to rehearse the night before, block the scene. And now without the pressure of the, of the crew looming, make decisions about camera placements and things like that. This was the opposite. This was, you know, this is scene seven of, of 14 scenes we're gonna shoot in a day. We'll do a blocking. You got two minutes to make decisions about how you're gonna shoot it. And then you gotta start shooting. And I was like, I'm just gonna embrace like whatever, whatever my gut instinct is in those first two minutes, that's what's gonna be in the movie. Are you, in, because you're shooting in a real house, this is not a sound stage. Yeah. Uh, and you know, are you shooting with? Is it one camera shooting? Are you doing multiple? Are there any scenes you're doing multiple cameras? One camera. So at, at all times, it was one camera. One camera, and that was both a uh, for COVID, just fewer people, but also I, I from a style point of view, I was like, I'm gonna commit. You know, we're gonna rehearse the scene. I'm gonna have like two minutes to figure out the three shots that I'm gonna use to tell the scene. Not the six shots with two cameras might give you, you know, I'm gonna, uh, because I'm gonna be like, these are the only shots I have. You know, I don't have a B camera that's getting me extra stuff. So what, what three shots do I absolutely need to tell this scene? Which I, I to be honest, I loved as a filmmaker that my, uh, my worst nightmare is a situation where you're like shooting a scene and it's like, okay, master over, over, single, single, right? That's what they might teach you in like film school. And I, I love that, that, that we, there was never even the possibility of us doing that. I mean, that, that I just described five shots. I was like, you know, for the most part, I was like, I'm gonna have to figure out how to tell the scenes in three shots. And by the way, I'm not interested in kind of, I know the, the audience watching the movie doesn't care that we pulled this off at 18 days. They don't care that we shot it in a pandemic. They don't care about any of that. Like I, 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 I I'm not interested in this sort of self-congratulatory style of, of filmmaking. Even, even Tom Cruise and I, when we talk about shooting a movie in outer space, we're like at the end of the day, the audience isn't gonna care that we shot this in outer space. Film geeks might, but the audience at the end of the day, they wanna be entertained. They don't care about how the sausage is made. And so, uh, and you don't get any credit for sort of doing this in the pandemic. You know, when we were, uh, um, you know, someone, someone said this to us, you know, uh, 
at some point they're like, you know, should do you, do you guys expect to get, you know, you, you expect an audience to sort of give you any, uh, any kind of free ride or, or give you any, uh, cut you any slack because you pulled this off during the pandemic? And I'm like, no, I don't. Like that's, you know, I think it's, you know, for your audience, uh, you know, that your audience is going to care about, you know, the um, mechanics of how the film got made. But, you know, the people, just your average person just tuning in on HBO Max, they just want to be entertained. They don't care that they did this in 18 days or 20 days or 40 days. And so um, we, but, uh, but again, my films, you know, nor do the audience watching Born Identity care that Matt Damon and I had to sneak around, you know, and shoot scenes in places we didn't have permits. They didn't care about that. They, they just wanted to be entertained by the movie. But, but I, I have discovered that when I allow uh, the, the, the peculiar situation of, each, of, of a movie, whatever, whatever the specifics of, of the, when I allow the specifics of the production to infuse what I'm shooting, I'm usually pretty happy with the end result. And so I was gonna embrace that with lockdown and not figure out how to cover a scene with three shots because I wanna like, you know, go to film schools and brag about it. It's because I thought, you know, it will set lockdown apart and, and it will it will be, uh, I think we can make something that will be more unique and, and therefore more enjoyable to an audience than if we shot it traditionally. Sure, I've, I've interviewed Roger Deakins a few times and what always fascinates me about what Roger tells me uh, is that he will always shoot with one camera no matter what he's making. And he even did that, um, uh, I can't remember the, the movie, with the Bond movie that he did, uh, that he shot it all with one camera and the producers and everyone were like, you need coverage. And he's like, no, I don't. I'm going to shoot it with this one camera and that's going to be the movie. But it's, it's so fascinating to me that there's no right answer uh, in terms of filmmaking. And that's why it's so exciting to talk to different people about the various ways people make a movie. And what's crazy about this business, and it, it, it's never lost to me, is that it's a business. And yet it's also an art form. Yep, exactly. And it's, it's you're like I just it sort of never ceases to amaze me that any movie really gets made. Well, the best movies are every once in a while films come along that are both um, really cool and artistic, but also you know commercially viable. It's when the art form and the business you know intersect, and um, it's always magic when that happens. You know, and it's uh, uh but anyway um so that means it was like no second unit on lockdown did you you made every you took every shot yeah that's also pretty cool um uh so you have a lot of cool cameos in the movie a lot of big name stars show up uh yeah. can you sort can you sort of talk about uh getting all these people involved was it one of these things where it's like i need you for an afternoon i need you for an hour how, how did it all come about yeah, well, first of all, we were going to be doing all the Zoom calls in real time. It's not like we shot Anne Hathaway's side and then separately shot the other person's side. Like, she was going to be acting against Mindy Kaling. It involved some tricky scheduling because Mindy's in L.A. and Annie's in, in London with us. And, you know, we got to find, you know, or it was really challenging for uh, Dulé and Jasmine, um, who had who had... Um, they had to start at three in the morning, LA time, you know, which was 11 London time, because we're doing it all in real time. Uh, but the, I, so the idea was, first of all, to do the, do this, the calls for real, which believe it or not is, is way faster, like way faster than if we had actually had a, built a set for those actors and filmed them, you know, with a proper film crew. And I was like, I want them even to the point where you talked about cameras and decisions about, you know, multi cameras and, you know, one of the early decisions was, you know, my producer PJ, who's, you know, kind of a techno, you know, he's really into to technology and cameras was like showing me all these different cameras that you could hook up to a laptop and you could zoom with it, but you know, it would be, cause like right now, like I'm using a, like I'm using a little camera clipped onto the top and PJ is like, we can clip a, we can use a red camera. 
<laughs> you know, and there's a way to use this interface and it can feed a signal through the USB into the laptop. And I was like, no, I think we should use the camera that's built into the laptop. We should use, if, if someone's using a phone, we should use the camera built into the phone. Like that should be part of the style of the movie. And so once we sort of made that decision, um, it meant that like, I didn't actually need to send anyone to, to someone's home. I didn't need to send a crew or anything. We ultimately decided we would send a sound person to everyone who appears on Zoom. We'd send, therefore, so we have one person who was sort of connected to our crew who, if the person didn't know how to use their computer or if the internet went down, there'd be somebody there that we could, who was on our team. Um, and, and, but from a safety point of view, it means we're only sending one human being into someone else's home um, because of COVID. You know, again, like I was sort of excited by the fact that the safest way to make a film during the pandemic was to leave people in their own homes whenever possible and have no actual contact with them. So, and, and to not mix and match people. So uh, with um, Anne Hathaway's boss in the film was scripted to have a teenage son. I started thinking like, who do I know? What actors do I know who have teenage sons or daughters? Because I don't want, you know, your normal way of making a movie where you would cast an actor and then you'd cast a team, you know, you cast the boss and you'd cast a teenager and you'd put them together. And I was like, no, there, we need to actually, for safety reasons, we need to cast a, a, a father, son, father, daughter combo. And so I thought about who, who I knew had teenage children and I knew, I know Ben Stiller and, and his son Quinn. And I, I called Ben up and I was like, you know, take us, you know, you know I, I need you like for a day, less than a day, like half a day. You and Quinn, you know, are you guys into doing this? You'd, you'd be at home, which by the way is where they were because everyone's locked down. It was like, you don't have to leave your home. Um, we'll, uh, and then, um, so a few days before we shot, Ben toured me around his house, you know, and we settled where he would be, where the camera would be, you know, literally just like doing this. Um, and then he, he took my uh, costume designer into his closet with, with FaceTime and showed, you know, we picked his wardrobe that way. And, um, and then all we did was send a, uh, a sound person over on the day of the shoot. So who made those signs? Maybe this is Talagadot, but you know, the person who was dealing with this said, I don't know. <laughs> Either Quinn or maybe Ben's assistant. Sure. We were just like, we need someone in, so we need, you know, we're like, we need signs. We need them to be this size. You know, we're, again, we're like, we don't want to have any interaction with you because of COVID. So like, but that was part of the fun and adventure of making this film. And, and Stephen Merchant, you know, he, he made that whole set and, and cut out those arrows for himself and, and um, uh, picked out his wardrobe. Um, you know, we had people sort of all over the world uh, you know, that I would Zoom or FaceTime with and, you know, we'd set up the shots and the scenes. And, and again, because the script was 180 pages, you know, I had to tell each and every one of them. I was like, let's just go through this once. And they would like run the scene with me and they would put all these dramatic pauses and they'd be like, here's the deal. The script's 180 pages. Like, you got to just say that dialogue as fast as you can. It's so, it's so interesting. I notes that they're not used to hearing. So, I, I'm curious about this. So you, you call Ben. Ben says, yeah, that sounds awesome. My son and I are going to do it. When he agrees, how tricky is it with like contracts with like agents and everybody? Because obviously that can go many different ways. Is it one of these things where it's a lot easier because everyone knows that this is not some big budget movie that like everyone's making this at a very low cost? Uh, how does it go on behind the scenes once like a friend of yours agrees that, you know, they want to do it. Um, Cause we sort of came up with the, the same rate we're going to give anyone who appears in a cameo. So we're like, this is just what we have. And because uh, um, Steve Knight and I were going to be, you know, giving a big portion of, of what we make on the film to uh, 
in Steve's case to NHS and my case to, to hospitals in New York. Um, it, uh, you know, so I, I think, you know, it was, I, I don't, I'm, like, it wouldn't surprise me if Ben, you know, takes whatever he makes on this film and he gives it to, you know, a medical charity anyhow. Like it was, it was, the film was sort of happening in that kind of context of, of um, we're all, we're all just embarking on this adventure together and, and nobody's trying to get rich. And it, it's a, it's, it's just a, it's a, and we think that this film could, could, could really, um, is really, really has a place in the world. You know, that, 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 that there's, you know, it's not like you're approaching Ben and you're like, here's a superhero thing set in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We're like, here's a movie that's set in our universe today. There's nothing else like that that's going to touch people and speak to them in, with an honest voice that people can relate to who are going through this pandemic and, and give them an escape at the same time. So it, it, the aspirations for the film were sort of lofty enough that it was... The, there was nobody was going to be doing this film for the money. Um, Completely. Yeah. Uh, my, this is my, I, I know I got to go with you, uh, but I just want to ask whose idea was it to have Chiwetel making bread during the credits? Again, it's, it's, it was one of these things where Chiwetel just mentioned offhand, uh, he was like, wouldn't it be fun if like maybe in the credits I was making bread? <laughs> he just met, it was like, in, like, just just mentioned it like off the cuff comment, like, you know, not expecting it to go anywhere. And the next day I showed up with the supplies to make bread. And I was like, do you mind staying after wrap? I'm gonna film you making bread. I think it's a great, he was like, what? I just, I didn't really mean that when I said that. I was like, well, and actually, um, my, because I also, I, we didn't want to take the time, because it actually takes some time to actually finish making the bread. Um, during the shoot day, because we were shooting in a real house, my two producers, PJ and Allison, made bread themselves. So I would have something for him to pull out of the oven at the end. It was such a tight knit family making this film, we were then competing over who made a better loaf of bread. and. You know, in a similar way, you know, Anne Hathaway, uh, the only, I didn't give any script notes to Steve. I said, we're shooting your first draft. That's going to be part of the, the style of this film. There's going to be a rawness to this because it's not going to be overworked, right? Films go through this development process and suddenly it can start to feel like a committee. And I was like, I want this to really have that, that really pure singular voice. It's like, everyone's doing their job. Steve, you're writing the script. I'm going to shoot your script. I'm directing the film. Like the producers are producing it. Everyone's just doing their exact job. There's no like co-mingling. And the only thing is that the only note I gave him is I asked him if he would write an epilogue when he finished the script. As though the script weren't long enough. I was like, I really would like to see, I, 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 wanna, I wanna be back at the house with them. And he wrote the epilogue, you know, while we're in the middle of shooting and suddenly it was like, okay, well, what's Annie going to wear during the epilogue? Because we had such a specific look for her, like a formal top and then pajamas on the bottom. But that didn't make sense for the epilogue that he wrote. And uh, Annie said, uh, it's similar to the bread thing. Annie's like, well, what about tie-dye? You know, because everyone was tie-dyeing during the pandemic. Like, it would be, wouldn't it be fun if I was wearing some tie-dye thing at the end? And I said, I love that idea. Uh, where do we get tie dye? It turns out in London in, in October, you cannot buy tie dye. It's just not, it's a spring thing, whatever. It doesn't. And I was like, fuck it. I, I'm going to, I'll go tie dye your shirt for you. Um, and I just asked the costume designer to give me some, some white shirts that fit Annie. And I brought it home. And because of the pandemic, I was living with my producer PJ and his wife and his toddler daughter so that we were in a pod. And I went in his backyard on a day off and started tie dyeing these shirts for Annie. And then PJ was like, well, I'll try that too. And, and uh, Rose's wife joined. And so we made a bunch of shirts and then similar to the bread, it was a bake-off. You know, we, we, we gave all the shirts to Annie and, and 
Um, and obviously I'm only telling the story because she chose my shirt. That's a, that's a really good story and a, and a good way to end the interview. Um, first of all, I just want to say, I know I really blew through the time limit we had and I just said, fuck it. Cause I wanted to keep talking to you and I'm sorry if you're late to another meeting or whatever you need to do. Um, but really I, I so enjoyed this movie. No, I recognize that. Yeah. Thank you. You know, considering the circumstances involved, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, it's, it's one of those, you know what I mean? Yeah. Thank you.